Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, and welcome to the Stein Seedcast. I'm your host, David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company. We've got another great episode lined up with special guests, expert insights, and discussion on everything you need to know about maximizing yield potential. Two weeks ago, we had our Director of Agronomy, Todd Schomburg, on the show to discuss our growing agronomy department. And this week, we're fortunate to have two other members of our agronomy team join us today, Corn Technical Agronomist Tony Lenz and Tom Larson. Tony, Tom, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. As corn technical agronomists, Tom and Tony's core focus is to supply our sales reps in the field and our corn customers with the right tools for success. They also help us manage the plot program and conduct in-field research regarding new tools and techniques. They're here to tell us today about some of the work they've been up to, including our emergent study and other agronomic topics. So let's get started. So to get things started today, uh, I always like to provide a little bit of context for the listeners. So if you would, um, you know, we've got two guests today. Tony, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, and uh, your experience within Stein. Okay, well, I started back in 1999 with the agronomy program, which was nice to get started with um, kind of the first agronomy team to get going with Stein and did that for many years and then became an RSA, so regional sales agronomist. And then the opportunity was available to come back and be strictly on the agronomy side. So that was exciting to go strictly agronomy because that would be my first love, would go out looking at fields, doing, looking at certain products and really digging into that. So getting back on the agronomy side the last three years has been awesome and, and really focusing on that, getting to do research, um, kind of testing too is kind of fun. So, Sure. And you you originally are from where? Well, I'm originally from Pomeroy, Iowa, by Twin Lakes, so it would be north-central Iowa, and then I moved up to the very northwest corner of Iowa and was at a co-op there and actually got to know, like, Doug Brower back in the day with Stein, and they came calling on us, and then um, kind of that way got affiliated with Stein and, and became a part of it in 1999. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. How about you, Tom? Yeah, so I've, uh, I'm coming up on my one-year anniversary with Stein and, and the agronomy department, and it's been... It's been exciting. Uh, No two days are the same, I say. Um, (laughs) We could be in a studio one day and a field uh, the next day. So um, my background uh, is is both sales and research. I spent the first 12 years of my career uh, doing research for a national brand and managing a research farm. And then I have I have 19 years of sales experience uh, managing a sales team uh, for a couple of regional brands as well. So you've, you've had a lot of different experiences, both of you, and, uh, and, and I think that fits well with the kind of core goal of our agronomy program these days, which is, you know, delivering information that's of value to our growers. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today uh, is some interesting research that you guys have going on this summer. And I uh, wonder if you want to tell us about this emergence uh, study work that you're doing. Oh, I'd love to. So we're calling it the emergence flagging protocol. And so the objective of what we're trying to accomplish is we want to evaluate our, our corn emergence and just to demonstrate how a uniform emergence impacts yield. So that's our objective. Um, and and there's, there's eight steps that, uh, that we've completed at this point. So the first step is to identify... Uh, one one thousandth of an acre, so we can uh, we can evaluate emergence. I don't think anybody wants to run out and evaluate a whole acre of emergence. That would sure. be pretty aggressive. <laughs> so, um, so what we did is we chose uh, four colors of flags to to represent the four different days of emergence. After the fourth day, um, we just we just flag it as that that fourth color, and uh, and, and so really the nuts and bolts of what we're doing is. Uh, identifying, and this flagging protocol can be used as a side-by-side with us versus a competitive product. And in, within the research team, we kind of doubled this up and we're evaluating uh, a corn, some corn treatment studies that we're doing as well to monitor the, uh, how the, uh, the corn treatment is doing. So the first day is, uh, is emergence day, right? So it's an emergence flagging protocol. 
uh, identifying when that, uh, when that corn plant emerges. And depending on where you're at, it's about 100 uh, GDUs to get that plant to emerge. And uh, when, when you're seeing that plant spike is, is day one, okay? And then it's, it's so vitally important to go back every day at the same time. Try to be to the hour, same time, because plants are emerging all the time. But once they're spiking through, so day one, we used a pink flag to designate that, uh, that emergence day. And so in, within that one one-thousandth of an acre that we chose to evaluate, you, you simply placed a pink flag by all those plants that emerged for that day. Day two, you went back with a different colored flag. Uh, in this case, it was a yellow flag. And, and, and now we, we have the pink flags flying in the wind and now we're looking for those second day emergence uh, plants so where we could put the yellow flags. Day three was a white flag, and if we had anything emerging on day four, it was, uh, it was a blue flag. And so it's pretty visually impactful when you see these flags out in the field. I always like to do it up along the road somewhere so you get a lot of attention uh, from the neighbors driving by. You know, you, you create those questions of, hey, what are you doing out there? Right. Um, but uh, why we're excited about this protocol is uh, it goes back to our, our genetics. Uh, so, so we have strong roots, we have fast emerging products, and, and it's really fun to compare those products versus the competition just to show how these plants, uh, how, how rapid they can emerge out of the ground. So I'm assuming the, you know, the objective or what you'd hope to see is, uh, you know, in your case, a lot, a whole bunch of pink flags, right? Sure. Because you kind of, even emergence is the goal. You know, we know it's not always going to happen in every case. But so for your, um, for your subset of an acre, you know, you may have 30, whatever, 34, 35 plants or whatever out there. And, and you're hoping to have a, a majority of those come up as pink. And then you might have a scattered number of white flags or yellow sure. flags or whatever. Okay. I think along that line, that's what I think the agronomy team found out. And I would tell you our RSAs and our ISRs are, that was the big thing is, is, you know, we go out and we do emergence scores much later. A lot of times it's at V3, V4, but what did they truly come up? And I think that's what our sales staff was like impressed to see how many pink and yellow flags you have. And I would tell you it was a good year to see fast emergence. We got to see our hybrids of Stein did very well in that first two days. And I would say in my area, in the Western uh, states, we did very well of getting those up as quickly as we can out of the ground. And they were as good, if not better than the competition. And that's why we did like to pick our hybrids against the competitor or do a treatment versus non-treatment or do an MX hybrid in our new lines to compare that to Maybe, like, for example, MX709, comparing that to the 9709-G and, you know, looking at the genetics end. And I think that part was even eye-opening for myself to see how many plants came up in the first two days. And that's what you hear. The national corn growers, the, the growers that want to win those contests, they want their corn plants to come up within 48 hours. Sometimes they like to see them within, the, you know, 24 hours. So I think that was huge and impactful for our group. And like Tom said, if you can have it near a road, you can come back in and look at that. You know, that that's very impactful. I mean, obviously, that probably ultimately starts with, you know, good seed, right? But I'm sure there's other factors that come into, you know, hopefully stacking the deck in your favor for really, really good emergence. What are some of those criteria? What are some of those things that are important? Yeah, so uh, a uniform seed bed, um, adequate moisture, uh, there was areas this spring where we didn't have uh, either one of those uh, those options. But um, and and to Tony's point, I've I've never seen corn emerge as fast as what we saw this spring. You know, I, I said I saw corn emerge in eight days, and of course he had to outdo me and say, "Well, I had some come up in seven days." <laughs> so I mean, I, I guess I guess it, it, things are better in Western Iowa, but. But no, to have that, to give that plant uh, every opportunity, and then of course even spacing as well is is critical. So having a uh, having a plant or a, a seed that singulates well and and plants evenly is also critical. And and I should note because uh, you're right. You know, one of the great things about this is such a visual learning element, which you know on a podcast is difficult to <laughs> to do. But one of the things you guys have done a great job of is capturing uh, some video. So. 
on Stein's YouTube channel, we do have some pretty good uh, tutorials about, you know, what this is and what this looks like. So if you're interested in what we're talking about, I'd encourage listeners to go to our YouTube channel and look up Flag Emergence Studies because we have some really great uh, content there that describes, you know, the, the initiative and the, and, the, and the process. You mentioned that, that in addition to just studying emergence, there's other factors uh, that you guys kind of threw into that mix as well. I think seed treatment was, was one of those, right? Um, and yeah, it would be along that line. I also want to mention with the MX series is we are working on, you know, just getting a better product always in the bag, right? Any way that you can do a better job of getting very, very uh, comparable seed size that you have in the bag, that's what you want to have. If you want uh, treatment-wise, we've improved the treatment on our MX series. So I think that's always encouraging as a company to figure out ways to improve what goes in the bag. And I think that's what we were able to see with singulation. We had growers, I was with a grower today, that talked about his singulation through his uh, planter. And he was saying 99% singulation. And that's, you know, what the industry and that's what growers demand. And I would tell you, uh, every one of his farms was over 99% singulation. And so that is, it's, that's big. And I think anytime you can see that, and again, growers that understand their planters, that have them set, They've got them set correctly. You know, we've got such planters that can go at fast speeds, but then they also have good, you know, they're, they're set up to handle, you know, not getting skips and doubles is what we're trying to get. And we really noticed that with this new MX line really showed, and it showed how it planted. Yeah, and 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 on the emergent study, the, the, the unique thing about it is it's flexible, right? So... So if a if a, if an ISR wants to take this out and do a comparison with a competitive product, they can. You can also use this emergence study to compare within, and, and that's what we did. We did the emergence study, um, comparing a, a seed treatment a seed treatment study that we did as well. We kind of combined the two, because if we're going to make a change or we want to evaluate how some of these products are behaving on our seed, what better way to do than to do an emergence study on it as well? Yeah. So you can look at really any of a number of different variables, as long as you have an A by B comparison, you can look at how that impacted emergence across those two, two different evaluations. And along that line with the seed treatment wise, what's, um, trying different treatments is, is you, that's what you're doing. You're trying to tie this whole thing together from start to finish. So if you do a flag study on it, and then you use, we have boards that we use to put, pick, or to put our plants on it. So anytime we can capture, a, digging up a plant, putting it on the board, comparing these six different treatments that we had, because we have our base product that we run, and then we run five different treatments out there. And if you can pull plants and lay them on the board and visually show people, because I think everybody's about visually seeing this. So if you can put those on the board now, you know, and then we get that, that pollination time. If we can go ahead and put that ear or that plant down on the board again and look at that root structure, see where it's at, see some of the uh, improved stock quality that we're seeing on some of this. So again, um, and our ISRs and RSAs can do that. They can put these uh, pictures on our info hub and it, it's accessible to our our company and then they don't go away, right? It sticks in your mind and it'll stick in your mind through the winter when you get to visually see what you've seen from start to finish. And and these, this treatment trial has been now in the second year with different treatments, and um, I think it's always good to always be looking forward. Well, and, and you brought up a good point. I think what's interesting is, again, whether you're comparing two different kinds of genetics or you're comparing one seed treatment versus another, there is a, a larger story to tell than just what happened in the combine, right? And I think it's really great now that we have you know this emergence data you can look at to say, well, we saw perhaps saw real difference in emergence scores across uh, between these two factors. Then, like you said, you get to later in the season, we do root digs and you see what the root structure is. And if that's different and how that may or may not correlate with the emergence data that you got. And then, you know, ear counts and eventually getting down to uh, harvest, you know, and those all tie together to tell a fantastic, uh, a more comprehensive story about the test that you were doing and, and what where it might have helped and where it needed to be better. Oh, exactly. And, you know, and emergent studies have been done before. You know, we, we didn't invent emergent studies. But what I think is unique, what we're doing is we're not done once we once we had noted the emergence, our work is about half done at that point. And so so those flags uh, remain in the field throughout the growing season. And then at, at harvest time, those those flags act as a, a guide for us, if you will. So what we're, what we're going to do is go out and uh, go back to that same one one thousandth of an acre 
and uh, in our studies and then harvest these ears. We're going to take all the agronomic notes. We want to we want to capture ear height. We want to capture top leaf. We want to capture tassel. And then, uh, we're, as Tony referenced, we're going to we're going to use our ear board and we're we're going to lay out the ears, all the ears, within this study, and then have the flag next to it. So. If you have a late emerging plant, maybe you know on day four, how does that ear compare to a plant that emerged on day one? And, and I think it's going to be very impactful. Again, we talk about that visual component, right? And so we can go back and, and look and see, are we getting consistency with this product? And, and I, I'm, I'm excited to see those results. Um, and then we're going to take it the last step and obviously to yield. We'll measure uh, what, the, what the grain weight is and the grain moisture, and we'll also look at the, the size of that cob as well. And the tail of the tape is, yeah, what's, what's it going to yield? And then hopefully from there we can figure out what different factors impacted that final yield. Last year when we were out taking our harvest notes, when we'd go out and we'd look at harvestable ears, and sometimes we would have a, a plant that would be barren and there was, you know, in, in, in a plot. Well, why was that plant barren? What was going on? And and maybe it's tied to this or maybe it's something different. But these, these emergence, an emergence study will give us that opportunity that if it's a late planting uh, or a late emerging uh, plant, uh, typically by day four, it's going to turn into a weed. And all it's going to do is rob the soil of, of nutrients and moisture. It's not going to be a contributing uh, member of society, if you will, in that, in that field. So in the past, it was go out and take stand counts and then go in the fall and see what you got for harvestable ears. Doing this study we go right back to that same spot every time to take our notes. And I think we'll have a better a better idea of what's going on that way. Yeah, so if you didn't get the result you expected, hopefully you know right uh, right when and where it kind of went off the rails, right? Correct. <laughs> it usually, it's usually at the planter. <laughs> <laughs> and I would mo- note on that, it was, that's why we, we do this all summer long. That's why this is a process internally that we want our group to get used to, our wholesale staff is, is you don't just walk away right at the beginning. It is a full summer job. And it may not be fun when you're looking at pollination and uh, how that's going, because you may be walking fields that you're you're being pollinated yourself. So it's something that you've you just got to go out there and, and again we we take it from start to finish and and you try to tell the whole story of why it happened. And um, I think this is a great great way to go back and and tell the story. So uh, like I said, for us in our organization, this is really the first year kind of conducting this front to back kind of approach. Um, so it's probably not fair to kind of try to assess this early on, but I'm just curious, based on what you've seen so far, uh, are there things that are reinforcing things you thought, or are there things that are surprising to you that you didn't expect, or things you have other questions about because of the data you're seeing? Uh, great questions. So I think in terms of a side-by-side uh, comparison with us versus a competitive product, I think it's it's a great uh, a great way to show the customer, the farmer, just what our genetics can do, and we're awfully awfully proud of of that quick emergence and that strong standing product. So, so from that standpoint, the results have been fantastic. Lots of positive comments of while wow, your stuff was out of the ground. I had an ISR call me from North Central Iowa, and he said uh, he said I took some MX four four two twenty. To, uh, to a customer, and he did his own emergence tests and stand counts with uh, eight national brands, and he said, we're the best. And I said, so you're saying this like you're, exci- you know, you're surprised. I said, we tell you that our products are really good out of the <laughs> ground, but they're not just great out of the ground. They're great all the way through the season. But it was very impactful for the farmer to see that. You know? So sometimes it's just getting that opportunity to show what we have. But on, when we're doing this study uh, internally on our seed treatment uh, study as well, those results have been astonishing, to say the least, based on the different treatments that we're looking at and the responses so far that we've seen on emergence. So we're excited to see those results. Yeah, I'd kind of agree along with that. Is I, I just like to see these, the MX line that we've been talking about and promoting is we are seeing a really good emergence. So whatever we're doing, you know, how we clean it, how we put the treatment on it is is showing that. And there's real numbers, right? It's a real tangible number that you can see and see how fast they come out of the ground. And again, we could tell you how good we are compared to the competitor, but once you see the numbers that we post on this and everybody can post that, um, 
and our group passes it around, you know, they get to see how consistent we are with a competitor. I would use the competitor as an example. We bag seed this spring, and I would tell you the quality of ours was second to none versus the other national brand that we were putting in in plot bags. And so, again, back to that visual side of it is, is if you get to see that, but you have to live it all summer. And that's what we try to tell our salespeople is you have to be there in the field. You can't learn it in the classroom. You're going to have to see it for yourself, see some of these new experimentals, see some of these MX lines, and, and just live in the field. And like you said, there's a difference between sort of anecdotal evidence and real statistics, right? You can think something, but then when you see statistical information, it, it reinforces what you uh, should believe. So so for purposes of this study, you know, again, it sounds like you've got a couple of other steps here in the process as we finish out the summer and into the fall. Like you said, um, some root digs, cornier boards, and ultimately hopefully getting good side-by-side data, right? Uh, correct. Any way that you can um, show the plant type, I think the root structure is really telling us, I just mentioned on the treatment trial that we've done, is there's a visual difference on one of the treatments that we have. You can see it. And so I went ahead and weighed those stalks and the numbers there. They are heavier stock with that treatment on there. So that, again, there's some numbers that you can take and you can and, and apply that and say, hey, we've got something there, but now does it correlate to yield in the end? And so anyway, we can we can document that through the root itself, through the way the stock root looks, and then go ahead and look at, does that correlate to yield? Because in the end, that doesn't that what really matters is you can sometimes have a pretty looking thing, but did it did it give you dollars back, right? Did it have a return on the investment? And so that's what we got to prove too, right? If you're going to show this, you better show that that was worth that cost that was applied to it. Yeah, they don't pay you for pretty stocks, do they? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> So again, I would just recap by saying, you know, again, I know we've got great content on the YouTube channel, so I would encourage listeners to go check it out. Uh, it's really, really an interesting uh, project. And again, you know, we'll look forward to, to tying it in with the uh, year-end results too and, and hopefully have both of you back on here uh, after we get the fall results and we can talk about, talk about, again, things we learned and things that Sometimes you get more questions than answers. You just know better questions, and maybe we'll have that as well. But So shifting gears a little bit, again, I know you guys have been traveling all around in your respective areas. Um, uh, as we get into kind of the final surge of the summer, I guess I'd ask what's, what's on growers' minds right now, or, or maybe uh, what should be on growers' minds right now? So I've been fielding calls on fungicide applications, timing of it, and if I should or shouldn't. And my response is, you know, I ask, well, what are your goals? What is, what is, what is your expectation from an application? And so, so if you're at that tassel, at that VT, or you're right at uh, brown silk, and, and you're wondering if maybe I should go out there and, and put a fungicide on, then it, by all means, do some research, find out if that hybrid responds, and, and either pull the trigger or not. And in that same regard, what are, what's the insect pressure? Are you seeing uh, an abnormal high number of, uh, of Japanese beetles? We were just talking about Japanese beetles seem to be uh, prevalent everywhere right now, as well as grasshoppers. That's another one, that, another insect that I've been running into a lot of. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe have, a, have an application where you're, you're you know, an insecticidal application that's knocking those critters off so they're not clipping those silks. Uh, Tony, what are you... What are you seeing? And I would I'd go along with that is I think anytime you're hitting August, we're trying to figure out how, I, I go back to the corn plant. We got to keep that corn plant alive as long as we can into the season. We have very good corns that flower early and they have a long grain fill and they seem to be very good at, at developing on time at harvest. So I'm not so worried on some of our products. If, if you need a fungicide and we want to keep that plant along as live, as long as we can, that's where the fungicide comes in handy. Any way to protect that from issues that we may have out there. We may have tar spot in some areas. There's some areas that are going to definitely have to look at that. You know, and if you get a rain event coming up here soon, you need to really look at this because we've got a high dollar crop right now in corn and soybeans. There is a, a good return on investment there. So if we can do that with a fungicide, I think it's something we really got to look at. And I know a lot of growers like to add their insecticide right in with their fungicide. There's some very, you know, we don't always promote generic uh, insecticide-wise, but there's some very good economic costs on some insecticide-wise too. So that seems to always be where you want to go. Do I need a fungicide? Do I need an insecticide to keep that plant alive as long as you can? Because which means more pods on that bean means a 
uh, heavier corn plant or heavier kernels that we're going to get out of that corn plant in the end. And I don't know, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It, it certainly from, from an outsider's view, non-agronomist, uh, that as you get into the later part of the season, the risk-reward factor for crop scouting seems to get higher. Uh, you mentioned, Tom, you know, Japanese beetles. I was talking to a neighbor of mine just last night. We were talking about how, you know, in, in two days his apple tree just became decimated. Uh, it was fine, it was fine, it was fine, and then it's, you know, just gone you know, it seems to me like those pests can do a tremendous amount of damage. And f fungal infections also just seem to accelerate in the summer heat. Is that fair? Oh, it's more than fair. And uh, I I would say that you should be in your fields on a weekly basis, but we, we know that that's probably not the case uh, all the time. But once you start getting into grain fill, uh, those pods are starting to fill out, those kernels are developing, uh, you got to know what's going on out there and you have to have a plan. Uh, do, don't be reactionary. Uh, have a discussion with your agronomist uh, and say, you know, do the what if. What if we have this? What if we have that? Are we at economic threshold? What is economic threshold? And have all those answers or those questions answered so then if and when that situation arises, you can implement a plan. I've seen so many times where emotions take over in the event of, a, of an infestation or um, something is happening that's, that's, that's adversarial to what we want, and, and we do a knee-jerk reaction, and usually that's the wrong reaction, right? So, so have that plan. Have a, have a, a marketing plan for your, for your crops. We, we hopefully market our grain appropriately, but do we have a plan in case we do get an infestation or have to harvest early because of a, of a late-season disease that comes in? Along that same line, I would say is standability on corn. You know, we really didn't, we talked about the diseases and that, but just overall standability and stein corn, that's one thing we're very proud of is a medium-statured plant, excellent stock quality, excellent roots. So um, I think if you are evaluating any hybrid, you need to be looking at um, how is that going to stand going into harvest because there will be people in parts of our country <laughs> that are listening to this that will be in the harvest part. And so you need to evaluate each hybrid, put it into category. Is it going to be a good standing hybrid? Does it look like it's it's one that could deteriorate fast? And then you get a plan on, on when we want to harvest. And, um, and again, we're very excited about some of these stein hybrids that we have just they can stay longer in the field. And we do have a few that we just need to get out early. So really evaluate that standability. So in intactness and plant health, uh, especially as it relates to, you know, harvestability. Tony, your area, uh, you work with a lot of our customers in, you know, northwest Iowa, uh, Dakotas, Minnesota. Where am I missing? It would be Nebraska. Nebraska. There. Yep. there you go. So generally, what's the, what's the crop outlook in the people you talk to? I would tell you we're, they're very optimistic. I mean, I'll just give you kind of a give you a regional side of it. Nebraska had got in planted early, but then they had a lot of hail events that moved across Interstate 80 and really set them back in some areas. But I would tell you as they had a good planting condition, so if you got that in in the middle of April and they didn't avoided the hail, they're off to a great start. They look like they're going to have great yield potential. Then you get into more of the dry land in Iowa and western Iowa, where we have some very dry areas that are going to be very important with um, – needing rain during pollination time and needing a little bit afterwards. I mean, we talk about those, there's million dollar rains. If you could get some some form of a rain event to help you with silking, because you need about you know, almost four tenths of rain a day when we're at that pollination and into that reproductive stage. So it's a very large need of moisture at that time. And so that's really, you know, as I'm sitting here today, that's, uh, that's a big thing I, I want to see is just rain events at the right time. You know, so the areas that have had plenty of rain have are able to store up that moisture. They're doing very well. Very little diseases out in the field. Um, they've cleaned up these fields very well. And so I would tell you as they're, they're set up, and, and like any year, it just comes down to timely rains because we saw that last year. We were very dry, but then we got those timely rains. And you talk to most growers across my western part is they couldn't believe where the yields came from. So, again, it ain't always about the total amount there. It's just timing, but um, it'd sure be nice to store up a little bit, you know, <laughs> in August. A little extra doesn't hurt. Tom, and so you have Minnesota, you have uh, a lot of Iowa, or what else? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. I've been dipping my toe into Missouri a little bit, okay. and I, I get into Illinois some. So So what, what, what's, what's things in your area look like? The, the word of the day is variable. <laughs> um so, so having rainfall events be so erratic, there hasn't been widespread rains 
across the region, um, but but yet we've had localized rains. Um, it seems like some rains decide they want to avoid a certain area. I was west of Mankato yesterday, and uh, they've had less than two inches of rainfall for the season. It's incredibly dry, incredibly dry. Uh, plants are showing moisture stress to the point I don't think some areas are going to come back, especially in those coarser soils. I think those crops are done. Um, and then you can go to other parts of my region, and, and it's just this lush vegetative. It, 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 they've been mowing their lawns all summer long, and, and, uh, and, and, and they're expecting great things. So um, I'm just going gonna, gonna to take the easy way out and say I've got areas that look fantastic, and then I've got areas that are, are just going to be uh, average to below average just based on the rainfall events that, uh, that have happened or haven't. So Mother Nature will once again <laughs> decide. <laughs> always, always decides. So as we kind of wrap things up here, uh, you know, you guys have both been doing this work of agronomy for a long, long time. I guess my question to you would be, you know, what do you wish that uh, folks knew about the job that you do that maybe they don't fully understand? I guess I'll just jump in. I always wish I could get called to just come out and look at good fields. I always <laughs> laugh about that over all these years. I would love as an agronomy person just to say, hey, could you just come look at that? Because I can't believe how good it is. So um, again, I just, but my uh, joking aside is I think it's, we all, every day you get to go look at something different. You get called to look at maybe a environment that, you know, being at this almost 30 years in, in agronomy is, is it never one day is the same, never one year is the same. And you're always going to see something different. And I love that. I love to be in the field every day when it's, even if it is 100 degrees and I'm, I'm in pollinating corn, it's still um, to see, just try to help a grower to get maximum yield. To see that look in their eye where they're just looking at you trying to say, hey, what do I need to do to to better what I'm doing already, right? And so that that tells me as they're putting faith in you, to help them to make a good management decision, whether it's, you know, what nutrients, help me with my planter to make sure it plants, you know, as best as it can, you know, to give me, um, you know, what what you think on fungicides, just, just from start to finish is, is how you can help that grower to to feed his family, really, and to have a have a good, you know, have a good income at the, at the job he's doing. Yeah. How about you, Tom? What do you wish that people knew about what you do? It's a great question. And I've, as, as Tony's been talking, I was thinking about this and, and, I think another name for what we do is is plant detective. So so it, it, we rarely get the calls to come out and look at how great everything is, right? But we get those calls to come out, especially this time of year, and say, what's going on? And as a detective, it's key to check your emotions at the door, not not jump to any decision, but yet be methodical. And sometimes you have a grower that's that, that wants an answer right now. And sometimes you can't give an answer right now, but you can say, let's go through the questions. You know, I have this mental checklist. We have to talk and ask the questions of how did we get to where we're at today? And, and, uh, and asking the right questions, he might divulge something that you'll go, aha, have you considered this or have you considered that? Or I need to pull soil samples to see what's going on. So, so as, a, as, a, as a plant detective, um, it, it's pretty exciting to go out there and, and when you have the satisfaction of, of coming back with an answer or, or, do, or coming up with an answer at the time that you're there, um, gives you great satisfaction. But um, I'm with you, Tony, when I get those calls and they say, um, man, you gotta come out and see this stuff. It looks great. Um, I'll, I'll be there in an hour. Because you know, because that that's exciting. So, um, but but at the end of the day, when they put their trust in you to to bring you the the support that they're asking for to be successful, what they do is, is something that gives me pretty good satisfaction. I love being in the fields every day as well, um, and uh, and and it, it's just fun to watch these uh, these plants mature um, from start all the way through harvest, and then to see not to be a cliche, but the fruits of your labor and, and to see those yields in the fall, um, it, it gives me it gives me pretty great satisfaction. Yeah, fantastic. So we've been visiting with corn technical agronomists, Tony Lenz and Tom Larson, about their roles with Stein and the flagged emergence study they're conducting with their fellow agronomists. Tony, Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, that's our time for today. I want to thank our guests and listeners for joining us for another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back again soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. 
And to never miss an episode, subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Stein has yield.